I mean, would encourage you to have your Bibles open at the passage. This is very useful for you to follow along. It's not going to be like first verse first. So it will be helpful to see where everything fits together. Now, don't you just hate it when you get stuck? Maybe a bit like food here. We need the food. You eat so much honey that you can't get through your best friend's uh, door. That hasn't happened to me personally. Um, <laughs> but I have been stuck. Uh, in fact, when I was starting to write this sermon, I was trying to think of a cool anecdote or a story that could really grab your attention, and there was nothing coming. I just, um, just sat there, staring at the screen, hoping for inspiration to strike. But getting stuck doesn't only happen when you do creative things. For example, if you get stuck in your job, you really hate working there, the boss is a jerk, and it's just destroying your soul, but you need to put food on the table, you need to earn money, and so you stay there, stuck. Or maybe you're in a share house situation, and you just don't get on with the other person, but the rent is cheap and you couldn't afford to move out on your own and so you're just stuck there with this this person you don't like and have to live with. Maybe you can even get stuck in yourself in patterns of thinking that are harmful or negative or sinful and you just wish you wouldn't think that way but you keep doing it because it's what you've always done. These are times when you don't like to be stuck, when we wish we could move forward. Sometimes though, that spot where you're stuck, you don't actually like it there, because it's comfortable, it's a known entity, it's safe. And that's where the disciples are in our section in John. They want to be stuck here, in this final moment with Jesus, that's where they want to be. They don't want things to move on. Jesus has been saying for a while to his disciples that he's going to go and die. And now it seems like he's saying goodbye to them. And they don't want him to go. They don't want him to go and die. Of course not. He's their best friend, that teacher. He's been with them for years. His presence with them has shaped their whole lives. But now he's leaving them. What are they going to do? Their hearts are troubled and they're afraid, as Jesus points out in verse 27. Now when we think of hearts, naturally we think of emotions. And this is true, of course the disciples are emotionally upset. But this goes deeper. When their hearts are troubled, it's like how we would say they're shaken to their very core. It's not just their emotions, but their whole inner being, their thoughts, their identity, their planning, their certainty. Nothing is sure anymore and they are afraid. What will they do once Jesus is gone? What is there for them in the future? They want to stay in these last moments with Jesus where everything still makes sense. And Jesus gets that. He understands they're upset and afraid of the future. But that doesn't mean he's going to say. He's not going to say just so they stop feeling bad. He's got a mission that he is on. A plan he has to fulfill. And so do the disciples. See all these final teachings that Jesus has been giving through, giving them throughout John chapter 14. It's preparing them for a life without Jesus. But they need something more, and so Jesus leaves them with two gifts: the Holy Spirit and peace. The first, the Holy Spirit, we heard a lot about last week from Marty. Thanks, Marty. And he's described here as the Advocate. In verse 26, Jesus says, But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will 
teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. The term advocate, of course, is a legal one. It is another word for lawyer. But the relationship that's being described here in John is more like a legal advisor than a strict lawyer who you pay to stand up in court and do law talking stuff as the judge. They're a legal advisor instead, working behind the scenes, which is like the work that Horizon's Family Law Centre does, where Ben works now. So the client will still represent themselves. But the legal advisor will tell them important things like what to do in their paperwork, what to expect in court, what they can and can't do depending on what the judge says, what the law means in that situation. So for Jesus' disciples, including us, we are still representing ourselves. We are still living out our Christian lives. But the Holy Spirit is acting like our legal advisor, reminding of Christ's word to us. What we expect in the Christian life. What we can and can't do according to what God says. What his words mean in our situation. Also, giving us everyday encouragement and support and comfort, which is more than most lawyers will do. So that's Jesus' first gift. His second gift is peace. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you, he says in verse 27. But what does he mean by peace? <clears throat> In Jesus' day, you could use the word peace, shalom, to say hello or goodbye. So if you were leaving, you would say shalom, and off you go. And in this context, where Jesus is leaving his disciples, they might expect that this is what he means. He's peacing out. But this is Jesus' own peace. My peace, I give you. This is different. In fact, what Jesus is doing here is he is drawing on the Old Testament concept of peace, which has this deeper meaning of the fulfilment of God's promises. God's people, free from war, dwelling with God in God's land, enjoying God's blessings. So what Jesus is telling his disciples here is that they are going to see the fulfilment of all these Old Testament promises in Jesus. They will see him ending the war with sin through his victorious death and resurrection. They will experience God dwelling with them through the person of the Holy Spirit. And then they will know that the final total fulfilment of God's promises will happen too. As Jesus says in verse 29, I have told you now before it happens, so that when it does happen, you will believe. The certainty of the future, cemented in God's fulfilled promises, is Jesus' peace. It's a peace that doesn't depend on circumstances. It's a still centre in the middle of a storm of uncertainty. The world might be going absolutely crazy. Like the disciples, we may not know what frightening stuff the future will hold. But we know. We know in the midst of everything that our eternal future is secure and that God is always with us. Jesus is not wrong when he says, I do not give to you as the world gives. As nice as any of our Christmas presents might have been, and I know there are some fairly nice ones out there, Jesus gives so far superior and help us on a most profound level. The gift of promises fulfilled and of God himself with us an absolute fact for us that shape our whole lives, the direction our lives will go. These gifts are not there for us just to put on a shelf and admire and 
not like the good China that you never actually get out unless the Queen visits or something. These are gifts for a purpose. So if you wanted me to put some nails into something, you would give me a hammer and then I'm ready to go and hammer those nails in. Jesus has been saying in verses 15 to 24, he wants us to follow his commands. And so he gives us his peace and the Holy Spirit so we can do it. The disciples here were unwilling to move forward without Jesus, but move forward they must. Because that's what God's plan has been all along, and that's why he gives them those gifts to move forward and to obey him. Jesus himself, of course, has his own mission to complete, as I mentioned earlier. He knows that the soldiers, led by Judas Iscariot, are on their way to arrest him as he speaks. They're on an evil mission, compelled by Satan, the prince of this world, as he mentioned in verse 30. But, Jesus also said, he has no hold over me. Satan, in his job as accuser, has not caught Jesus out in some kind of sin. The crucifixion is not Jesus being punished for some sort of evil that he has done. It is Jesus being obedient to the Father's great plan of salvation. As he said further in verse 30, he comes so that the world may learn that I love the Father and do exactly what my Father has commanded me. Jesus is very keen to emphasise his obedience here. In fact, in verse 28, he says, The Father is greater than I, emphasizing how he is obedient to the Father's instructions. I should just briefly clarify something here about Jesus saying the Father is greater than him because I think it's important we don't get confused. While Jesus was on earth as a human, he was less great than the Father. Being a human, he was limited in many ways. For example, he could only be in one spot at one time. Uh, he could die, for example. But everything changed when he sent back to heaven and regained equal glory with the Father as God. Philippians 2 summarises this very well for us. From verse 7 it says, he made himself nothing. By taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient, as obedient again, to death, even death on a cross. And because of this obedience, therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. Not, not second, but every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The Father is glorified in this, but equally Jesus is glorified in this, both as fully God. But aside from enabling God's plan of salvation, Jesus' obedience also provides the most important example for his disciples. For all of them, for Jesus and the disciples, there will soon be a great time of loss and sorrow and even uncertainty. But God's plan is perfect and just as Jesus is surrendering himself to that plan in obedience, so also should the disciples. Both their new roles will be even bigger and better than before. As Jesus says in verse 28, If you love me, you would be glad that I ever go to the Father. If Jesus goes to the Father, then he will receive the glory that is his. If he goes, then he will return to fully fulfill those promises he said he would. If Jesus goes, the disciples will receive his spirit and his peace 
has spread the gospel to the ends of the earth. These are amazing future roles. It's just waiting for them. And so Jesus ends our passage with, Come now, let us leave. Now, at first glance, actually, this seems like a bit of a weird statement because if you look in your Bible there, this is why I encourage you to have them open, you'll see the next section is something like the vine in the branches. Jesus is still teaching his disciples. No one has gone anywhere. So why does he say, come now, let's leave? But I would suggest that instead of seeing this as a break, off to do something new, we should think about this this verse in the bigger context of what we've just explored then. Probably a more helpful translation for us would be, get up, let us go from here. It's a bit more of a literal translation for you, but I think it's more helpful. Just as Jesus was about to go out on the next step of his mission, So the disciples must move from where they are and take the next step in their journey of faith, even if it is unknown and scary. But they're not alone. See, Jesus says, let us go. Jesus walks with them, away from that comfortable, known place, into this wonderful future. And just as Jesus is calling the disciples forward to walk in the new life that he has prepared for them, so he calls us too. We are also his disciples of God. See, when we first became Christians, we were given new life in Christ. And even if we've been Christians for ages, he still calls us into new life. New understanding, new opportunities new ways to become more like Christ as we listen to what the Holy Spirit is saying to us. Our always new life brings new opportunities to bring glory to God and to build his kingdom. So Tim, for example, Tim and Chantelle Young have just gone and moved to Marrickville, or that moved that church going to Marrickville, so they can explore different ways of serving a different community. And Transom has moved from our 6.30 service to the 10 a.m. service so she can share Jesus with visitors more readily. I moved to Namibia to teach local church leaders how to teach the Bible more responsibly. Not because I felt any particular calling or anything, I didn't really have a heart for Namibia in particular. But it was because God had equipped me with his gifts. I saw an opportunity and I took it. Simple as that. The Spirit will prompt us to look for these opportunities that he gives me. He'll point them out. How can I serve this person? How can I serve the church? What loving word does this person need? How can I pray for people? How can I listen well? How can I rest well? He also gives us all unique gifts that we can use to show Jesus to others and to build his kingdom. You know all that stuff that you're good at and that you really enjoy doing? Think about how you can use that to glorify God. How you can use it for his kingdom and his people. Talk with other Christians about your ideas. Perhaps you'll get some more. Perhaps you'll join together and form a ministry. That's how Ministry of Games started, and it's still going up for more than 10 years. We don't have to do big things or go far, but we can do big things, and we can go far. And why not? Jesus has equipped us for it, already. So I ask you, what's stopping you? Are there things that you are still holding on to that are making you stuck? 
Are you still looking back into the past when you think that things were better? Are you spending so much time looking back that you can't see the doors that God is holding open for you in the future? Are you still holding on to some kind of pain? Where someone has wronged you or you've suffered terribly and it's become so much a part of you that you can't see the hope and healing and new life and purpose that God is holding out to you. Are you holding on to routine and comfort where it's too uncomfortable to even think about being challenged and growing into the world that God is calling you to? Are you still holding on to your old self, the person that you used to be before you met Christ, the person you know, thinks you are, and you're not able to see the real person that God is calling you to be? The new person transformed by the Holy Spirit who can do some amazing things for him. We often have so many reasons to stop, to get stuck. But that is not our path as Christians. Our path is forward. God is opening many new doors for us and it's up to us to walk through. He's gifted us with the most precious gift of all. His spirit, his peace. So let's do it. This January, many of you may have been thinking, oh, new year, new me. Let's go a step further than that. New year, new me. New life. New opportunity. New mission. New ministry. And so even as you think about how am I getting myself stuck, Look up. Let the Spirit move you forwards. Look at that racetrack spreading out before you. The path you could take, the adventure map in your hand. Where is God leading you now? Where is God leading us now? Together. Let's think about these things. And then let us get up and go from here. To wherever he will leave us. Right. Lord God has given us so much. You've given us your spirit, You've given us your peace, You've given us yourself. We thank you for that. We praise you forever for that. I pray that you would use us, open our hearts and our eyes to see the opportunities before us. We pray that we will walk into those full of courage, knowing that whatever happens, our eternity is secure. You are with us. Pray that you will grow your kingdom through us as we are obedient, just as Christ was obedient. And we pray this in his name. Amen. Amen. We are going to sing again. Thank you.